Okay, now going from a skis to ggplot2. Um, so as you may recall, um, and if you're familiar with French, a skis means sketch. And so um, you can kind of really see here with the hex stickers, um, you know, a skis is a nice starting point, uh, but ggplot2 is, is what a skis is using to create plots. And um, it really provides us an opportunity to take things further. So why do we need to even learn ggplot2 if we can use a skis? Well, to be honest, you can get away with it at the beginning probably, but you can do a lot more with ggplot2 than you can with a skis. Um, you can have more customized branding, you can make your plots interactive, you can combine your plots in various ways. Um, eventually, you know, when this gets easier, you might actually become faster than you would going into the separate window and coming back. Um, and if you wanted to have, you know, making, wanted to create plots programmatically within a script or within a function or something like that, which we'll talk about later, it might be helpful to know how, uh, how this actually works. Okay, so this uh, package was created in, in 2005. Uh, it's called GG because it's uh, grammar of graphics. That's what the G, G stands for. Um, it's part of the tidyverse packages and you may hear people say, create a GG plot for this project. And what they mean is use the ggplot2 package. Um, and so the, the main concept to get to understand about ggplot2 is it's all about layering. And it's about putting plots on top of one another. And we use this plus sign to do it. So it's extremely powerful and flexible. We'll show you some of the really cool things that you can do with it. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of resources about how to create plots online, um, but the the issue is it is a little bit tricky and difficult. But hopefully we're gonna we're gonna help you with some of that. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to to go to this ggplot2 gallery link that we have here. This is a really great uh, website, and can everyone see this website now? I think so, right? Okay, great. So um, I, I suggest that you, you check it out. There's lots of information about what different plots look like, and we're only gonna cover some today, but there's so, so many that you could do. Um, and as you scroll through, you can see some of the amazing things that people have done, um, that just a variety of things that you could do to change the appearance of your plots and to plot different types of data. Um, in terms of, you can add labels, um, you can just make really complicated plots. There's also this, these are all buttons, so you can try out different themes to make your plots look different, um, and information on making your plot interactive, violin plots, just so many different different styles and people even make art using ggplot2 which is pretty amazing if you're into that you might like that okay um importantly though your data needs to be in tidy format uh to be able to use ggplot2 nicely um and so what do we mean by that we've been spending the last I don't know how many days, I guess today is seven, day seven. So we've spent about five days working on wrangling. And so you can see how important it is. Um, this actually ends up being the most time intensive part of most data analyses. And so ultimately you want your data to be in a state where each variable is uh, its own column and each observation or sample is a row. And so, when we have messy data, we might have column headers that are not variable names. We ha might have multiple variables stored in a single column, which we know now we can use the separate function to, to fix. Um, we might have 
things stored across both rows and columns. Uh, there's all kinds of issues that we could have that we've kind of gone through. Um, so this is sort of an example of tidy data. I would argue that you also might want to separate out um, the, the money, the dollar sign for some of these income brackets. Um, but you know, here religion looks great. It's it's um, in one column, and and frequency looks great. Um, and this could be instead like this, which we know from yesterday. This would be the wide format of the data, um, and we have values here for headers, uh, which can make it complicated for for plotting. So uh, if you want to learn more about what tidy data is and what it isn't, I suggest checking out this um, tidy data uh, description written by Hadley Wickham. All right, so we're gonna create some data to work with ggplot2 to get started and it's gonna be very simple. Um, to create the data, I set a seed because I'm creating some random data. Um, I'm using the seek function to create data from one to 30. So that's creating an integer that goes from one to 30. As you can see here, it goes up to 10. And if we kept going, it would show us that it goes all the way to 30. Um, we're also making, um, we haven't gone over this, but um, this is similar to sample. However, in this case, we're, we're making uh, um, normal uh, distribution of data of up to 30 um, uh, in length. And together we have two variables, one's integer and one's double. Remember double is double precision. So that means we have uh, fractional or decimal values. Um, so now we're gonna create our first plot with ggplot2. All right. We're gonna take this slowly and go through each piece. Um, the first part that's important to know and that looks a little bit strange and it's, it's gonna create an empty plot that we're going to then layer our, our values uh, of data on top of. So the first part is called aesthetic mapping. And there's this argument that's um, not required, but optional called mapping. It can be helpful if you want to use it to remind yourself what it's doing. Um, and inside it, you need the aesthetic function to uh, describe what you're plotting in general on your plot. So um, you're going to assign, if you're plotting something on the x-axis or if you're plotting something on the y-axis, this is where you're going to do it. And so the general format here, first of all, you're gonna need the, li the library for ggplot2, um, but you're gonna use the ggplot2 function. You're going to specify what data you want to plot. You could also pipe into this function. Um, so, so far, this is the same as what we've seen before. We have this optional argument called mapping equals, and then the aesthetic function with our x assignment, and our y-axis assignment. So when we use the data that we just discussed, we're going to have the name of the data, which we have a tibble called my data, and we have two variables. And so we're using the mapping equals aesthetics, x equals variable one, and y equals variable two. This is what we'll get from the output of this. As you can see, we're we don't have anything on our plot really, except we have, uh, we've listed what our variables are and they match according, the, the axes match according to the range of values, um, but we don't have any points. And to actually add points or box plots, et cetera, lines, so many options, um, there's lots of choices. We use these functions called geom. Let's start with geom underscore. And so, you know, if you have ggplot2 loaded, oops, always helps to actually spell things correctly. 
Um, so if you type in geome in your console, you can scroll down through all of these. There's so, so very many, and you'll get descriptions of what they are. You can also take a look at that gallery, like I said, to learn more. But if you're actually in R and you forget, um, this is a great way to, to do that. These are some of the main ones that we'll be talking about. Um, Geome point creates a scatter like plot with points. Geome line creates lines. Box plot creates boxes. Uh, histogram makes um, is a special type of bar plot that has to do with frequency. Um, bar plots, uh, which are similar to histogram, but a little different. Column, which we'll talk about the difference between that and bar. Um, you can add error bars, uh, tiles, which is kind of like heat maps, um, lots of options. Okay, so now we, you know, so far we've just had this empty plot. We want to add something to it. So what we need to do is add our plus sign and then add whatever geome type that we want to add. Um, ignore this, this is not supposed to be there. Um, so here we add our, our geome point and our plus sign to the code that we previously had to create the empty plot. And now we can see that the points are, are plotted here. So we could kind of read this part as add points to the plot using the data specified by the aesthetic mapping. Okay, so, but um, like I said, this, this layering option is really great. You can do things like um, creating multiple plots and putting them together. Um, in this case, because we're using a special way of demonstrating slides, you could put plots together like this. If you're really excited about combining plots, I suggest that you check out the patchwork, patchwork package, which is um, listed here. Also, the open case studies uh, has lots of resources about how to use this package, um, as well as a, another package called Calplot. But often you're going to want to combine plots together. So instead of having them separate here, we can put them together, which makes it a lot easier to see what's happening with the points. And so here we have our original line of code, which describes the mapping of the variables. We have our plus sign plus the geom point to add the points. And now we have again our plus sign and geom line to add the line to our plot. And so the nice thing about this, um, which we can kind of do in a skis, but to the level that we can do here, um, we, we can add a bit more um, specificity. We can actually adjust aspects about each of these um, geome layers separately. So in this case, I'm changing the points here to be larger using a size argument. I'm changing them to be red using a color argument. And I'm using something called alpha to make them a little bit transparent. But then for the line, I want something different. I want it to be not super big. Uh, I want it to be black. And I want it to have a dashed uh, sort of style. And so that for that, I use a line type argument. And there's, there's several um, different line type options. But I can also change the look of the entire plot, which you saw a bit on the GG gallery. Um, with these functions that start with theme. So here I'm showing, this is all the same code as before, but I've added now, again, with a plus sign, um, a theme dark, um, which makes the entire plot look a little bit different. Also here I'm, I'm plotting with a, a brown um, line instead of black. Um, you can also change specific elements if you don't quite like the theme, but you like most of it. This is a theme called theme, I think it stands for black and white. Um, and so it's theme BW. I can say that I want the font to be size 20. 
and I want it to have a different font style. And so this is nice if you're working to create plots for a uh, journal that has very specific requirements um, for font. Um, this is a way that you can change that. And I've had added links here for the various style uh, options for fonts. Okay. And of course, it's always very, very important to add labels to our plots so we can um, create labels using a function called labs, short for labels, and we can specify what type of label we want. So here I'm adding a title, um, which gets produced here. It's automatically left justified um, or left aligned. I want an X axis uh, label to be variable one. So that changes it from what it was automatically, which was var underscore one, which is the name of the variable. Um, and I do the same for the Y axis. You can also add a subtitle using this function, which can sometimes be useful. Um, and that's the subtitle argument. So I'm going to take just a moment to, to try to um, do this here. Um, and again, if you get a little confused about what's going on, you can play around with the skis and look at the code output uh, to see your data. So I'm going to work with the orange data set, which looks like this. It's got three variables with tree number, the age of the tree, and the circumference, circumference. And we worked with this um, yesterday in a skis. Um, I could do this. This is just showing you if you forgot what the exact function is, you can do this. Um, this is not required though. You can delete what package it's coming from, but you could pipe to pipe into ggplot2 or you can directly use it in ggplot2 just like our other tidyverse functions. And then I can say mapping equals, but again, this is not required, or this part is required. X, I want the X axis to be tree. I already suggested it. I want the y-axis to be circumference. And so this will create our empty plot. Which we see here. And now if I want to actually show something, I have to add a plus sign in genome point, for example. And they're there. Um, another useful aspect that you might want to try is changing the limits for your uh, axes. So sometimes um, this is useful because it might be that you have a range from zero to 100 or something, and it's useful to show the entire range, but the data doesn't actually reach that. Um, then you can specify using these functions. This is for the x axis, this is for the y axis. Um, so, in this case, again, we just add a plus sign and this function, and we're saying that we want the range of the x axis to be from zero to 40. So the data only goes up to 30, but now we've expanded the um, space for the plot along the x-axis and we have a, a tick all the way to, to 40. But sometimes we don't really like the way ggplot automatically plots the x-axis or y-axis ticks. So we can use something called scale x continuous or scale y continuous to change the way that things are plotted. 
Um, and we can use a breaks argument to, to really specify what each of the individual um, breaks should be. So in this case, we can use, this is very nifty and helpful, to use that seek function. Remember, this is to create integers, a sequence of integers. And we can specify from where we want to start um, to where we want to go. So we want to start from 0 to 30. And we want to increase by 5. So here we get a sequence that goes 0, 5, 10, 15, et cetera. And so now we want to use this as our breaks for our tick marks for our uh, x axis. So we can, again, use the plus sign, use the scale x continuous function, the breaks argument, and then just put, plop this whole sequence um, right here into the, you could also list this, you could do this combined function with C parentheses and put 0, 5, 10, et cetera. But um, you know, this is nice to have it programmatically if you have a really wide range and you don't want to put 0 to 100 by 5 uh, by hand. And so we can see now on the x-axis that this has changed from what it was um, before. So this is what we had before. So that can be very, very useful. OK, um, with that, we'll go to the lab unless there are questions. OK, um, so let's get started on the second half here. All right, so we talked about this a bit in, in the lab breakout room that I was in, but um, this may be new for the other groups. And I saw that there was a question about centering the title, and indeed, we are covering it right now. Um, <laughs> so the theme function helps you to modify various things about your plot um, besides what we can modify for each of the individual uh, geome uh, layers. So the theme function is helpful for modifying text, for modifying the basic plot area, so like the background of the plot, the, um, the grid lines, which are these lines, the axis ticks, uh, etc. Um, the legend. Uh, so there's lots of things that you can do with this theme function. Um, so here we're using it to change the title. Generally, we want our title to be a larger font size. So we're doing that here as well as adjusting it so that it's centered. So to do this, we'll go the, into more depth on this, but we we can type in the theme in our, let me, let me change this so this is a little bit easier to read. So we can type in theme, question mark theme like this, and we can get lots of documentation about what we can change in our plot. Uh, so this can help us add extra lines and change them. Um, you can see that the axis labels and texts and ticks can be changed. Lots of things about the legend, the panel, which is the background, the grid lines, um, captions. We'll talk more about what strips are in a bit. And so, if you start typing in theme, you can also see um, more information about suggestions. And if you press tab, you can see them here as well. Um, so here we're changing plot title. We can see, oh, I wanna change title. We could also do this here. This is gonna change not only the title of the plot, but also access titles. So we only want to change the plot title, and we'll have to scroll down until we find it. And then if we press, oops, we'll need to specify what aspect we're changing. So we need to include some argument. Again, we'll, we'll go over more of this in a second. I'm trying to figure out where this is in the... Uh, 
Um, yes, okay, so we're wanting to change something related to a title or a, or a text, which would involve something called element text. You can see that for other things, if we're changing line, we're changing an element that's a line. So we need this element text function, function, and then we specify what we want to change. So if we type in element, if you remember that part at least, we'll see all the options. And we wanna change text because that's what the title is. And we would want h just equals 0 0.5 to make it halfway across the horizontal plane and then size would change the font and 20 is a, a large font. So I don't have a plot right now, but I can get all of that just from um, what, we've, what we've done here. So if I wanted to do this for the orange data, I'm just going to put that there. It's going to get angry. Um, I can say orange and a yes. We're not getting suggestions here. Let's take a look at our tree, orange tree data. equal sign. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there's our plot. And now I want to add all of the theme title stuff that we worked on. I'll need to also add a title. Labs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. That didn't work. A little hard when it's scrunched like this. All right, and now we see our plot here. Um, one important feature to point out is you can press zoom and it'll make a pop-up window with, with your plot that you can change the dimensions of the plot. Okay, so now, pointing out the inner workings of this theme function. Um, so like I said, using the question mark theme will give you the elements that you can change. And then um, for each one of these, you have to use this element underscore function that's specific for whatever it is that you're changing. And they fit whatever aspect you're, you're trying to change. So if you're changing a title, you would wanna use text. If you're changing a line, you would use element line. Um, if you're adding rectangles, sometimes people add rectangles onto their plots that show a specific part of the background, um, then you would use that and element blank gets rid of things. And then there's all these various things that you can change about each one that differs. Uh, you can change the text size, color, um, fill should not be here, face can be the, the whether it's italic, bold, um, Angle would be whether the text is angled, position of the legend. Um, for rectangle, the line type would be the border. 
um, et cetera. So here we're using the theme function not only to adjust the title, but also the X axis. And so here again, we have, because this is the title of the X axis, it's the text. So we're using element text and we want it to be larger than our, um, our tick mark labels, but not as large as our title. So we'll make it size 16. And here, uh, we're using the orange data that I just showed you and creating a box plot. Um, and if we did this over here, you can see that we have this legend here that's not very useful because we already have tree labeled on the bottom x axis. So to get rid of that, we can say theme tab until I get to legend. I want to change the legend position. And oops. unfortunately here, it doesn't tab our options, but I know that if I do none, I can change it to get rid of it. I could also do top if I wanted to move it to the top, which can be useful at times. Or I could do the left or the bottom. Um, if you wanted to create your own theme, that's not something we're gonna cover in class, but say you're reusing a similar style where you always want your title to be size 20 and you always want your axis labels to be size 16. You always want your tick marks to be blue because you're into that. Um, you could you could make your own theme with branding for your institute or your lab, um, and that can be really helpful because then just like we use theme black and white or or others, um, this you could have your own theme here that you just add to your plot to make it style uh, exactly the way you like. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about grouping um, variables and why we sometimes need to do that in plots. So we're gonna plot oh, some data that's a bit more complicated. So we're gonna be working with some data that has to do with grocery store information. So we have information about rice and um, pasta. So we have two categories of food and we have four different items for each. So we're making our category uh, vector or variable by using the repeat function to repeat this vector, which is a combination of these two strings, pasta and rice, and we're gonna do each one 20 times. And then we're going to recreate a sequence of uh, integers from one to four that we're going to repeat each of them 10 times as our item ID. And we're going to use a function called paste zero, which just pastes this uh, string in front of the item ID vector um, without any spaces. And then we're going to create another variable that's integers from one to 10, as if we observed 10 different time points for each of the four items. So that's our observation time variable. And then we'll have an item price change, which I've created um, four different series basically of, of um, numeric double values uh, for, for how that price might have changed for each of the individual four items. And then we add every combine everything together into a tibble. Um, using the tibble function and we name it food. So if we take a look here, we can see that we have our first um, ID. We have ID one, two, three, and four, and we have two categories. So we have pasta for ID one and two um, and rice for two and uh, three and four. We have 10 observations for each of the IDs and we have price change values for each of those. All right, 
So if we were try if we were to try to plot this data, we would have an issue because we would get a really weird looking plot like this, um, which kind of looks like Bart Simpson's hair or something. And uh, it doesn't look right. Uh, <laughs> something's confusing about this. So anytime you do a genome line um, plot and you see something like this, uh, this is the time to question what you plotted. And so if we add this group uh, argument and we say that we not only want to plot observation time on the x-axis and item price change on the y-axis, which were our two uh, double variables, but we also want the item ID um, uh, variable to be a grouping variable for our data. And so now this groups our data by item ID. Remember, we have four different items. And so now we have four different lines. So this is a lot, a lot better looking. Like we can kind of see what's happening with the individual items, whereas in this plot, it's anyone's guess. Um, however, if you're using colors, which unless you're doing a black and white um, plot for a journal that doesn't allow for color, uh, then this will often take care of this issue. So if we add color, it will automatically group here by item ID. And so now it's a little even more clear what's happening because we see that ID 4 is this top line. ID three is the second line, ID one is the pink, and ID two is the green. Um, so, but this this isn't always enough <laughs> because say we want to plot by color for item category, then we're still going to get some some Bart Simpson type of hair uh, in our output, and this is again not quite right. So in this case, we might need to group by item ID and color uh, by something else. So here we want to see how the two rice uh, costs are changing relative to the pasta. And we don't really care so much about the individual ID, um, but we want to make sure that we actually separate the data so that we can see more clearly what's going on. So in this case, we would want to group by our ID so that each line is for our ID, but the color is based on the item category of being rice or pasta. Okay, but sometimes um, it's even more clear to do something called faceting, which we saw yesterday when we were using a skis. Um, and to actually do this manually, we have two options. We have facet grid or facet wrap. So facet grid will always create some sort of grid shape automatically, and facet wrap has some more flexibility. Um, to use them, we need to use this tilde sign to specify what category or what variable we want to facet by. And you can do even fancier facets. You can facet by two var uh, variables. Um, where you would have one on the left and one on the right, because remember the tilde is for specifying left and right. Um, but in most cases, you'll often just need to facet by one thing. So here, it's a little bit clearer to add a facet here and separate uh, by pasta and rice, um, which can be, if you had a lot of different items for each one, um, you might have overlapping lines and then it's unclear exactly uh, which ones are rice and which are pasta. And so having uh, the facet can, can help. So again, to do this, we add our plus sign, just, just like we always do with our layers. And we use the facet grid function, the tilde, and the variable that we are faceting by, which is the category variable. But uh, facet wrap is a little more flexible and has some exciting other things that we can do. Um, so it'll wrap things around and just like when you would wrap text in a text file or something like that, um, or in your um, Excel or Google Sheets, 
uh, so it allows us to continue plots in, in more specified ways. So here we can add an argument like number of columns equals one. And instead of having the plot side to side, we can have them in a single column. We can also add an argument called scales equals free. And because this is not in a grid where we're sharing axes, we can have different axes for each of our, um, our plots. So here we have the same axis for our time points um, because that's not different for either of the sets of data. But for pasta, our range of price change is much smaller than the range of price change for rice. So here we see that the y-axis only goes from 0 to 2.5 for pasta, but it goes all the way from 2 to 8 for rice. And this can be really useful if you have very, very different ranges. And so sometimes all of your, like if, if rice price changes were 100 or something in the range of 80 to 100, then our pasta data would kind of just get squished down at the bottom and we couldn't really see what's going on there. So adding scales free can be helpful for this. There's also options just to change the scale, make it free for one of the variables. Um, so only for the X axis or only for the Y, and you would do that with an underscore X or Y. In this case, it didn't matter because there wasn't going to be a change to the X axis. So it was okay to use just free. Um, but I guess this would be the same as if we did free underscore y. Okay, so now I wanted to just cover some general tips uh, for things that can go wrong and also ways that you can expand um, on your plots. So first we'll, we'll cover some things that are useful to know. So um, generally you wanna use color for points and lines. If you do it for box plots and bars and columns, you're going to get color on the outside of your box plot, not on the inside. And it's often useful instead to have the color on the inside. So if we want color on the inside, instead of using the color argument, we would use the fill argument. So we're gonna fill the insides with um, color based on this variable. Um, if you move the plus sign to the front of a line like this, you will get an error and your plot will not work. So you need to have the plus sign at the end of each uh, layer that you're adding onto. Similarly, if you start using pipes, that will also not work. You can use pipes before you get into the ggplot, but once you start using ggplot, you need to use the plus sign to add layers within ggplot. Um, the, it's a good idea to add uh, geom jitter on top of box plots, because then you can show people what the individual values are. And so here we're showing you know, the same data, but on top of our box plot layer, we also have a jitter layer. When we generally run jitter, the points will kind of be all over the place and that can be kind of annoying. Um, so if we use this width argument, then we can narrow the width of the points so that they're in a more um, narrow fashion that's easier to see. Um, in terms of coloring, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are people with various color blindness, and it can be difficult for them to see the difference between certain colors, in particular red and green, which is actually the default coloring usually. So to avoid that, you can use two functions. Um, this is for discrete or categorical data. Um, in this case, that's what we have because we're um, coloring by pasta or rice. So if we just add with our plus sign, this scale fill viridase D, then that will change the colors from being red and green to now they are purple and yellow. 
or if you had a continuous variable, you would want to use um, the underscore C for that. Um, it's important to note that although you can't put pipes in between the layers for your ggplot, you can use pipes before and you can pipe data into ggplot. So we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, the usefulness of this is that you can, um, you don't have to keep creating new data objects for each of your plots, you, and it makes it a lot clearer what exactly you're plotting. So you can wrangle your data to get it into long format, for example, or to, in this case, we're taking our food data and we're grouping by item category, and then we're using the summarize function to create a new variable um, in a new data set that, that's smaller that just has the um, max price change using um, the max function. And, um, this is good because then we have just one value for each of the categories, um, which would be the max change that we see. So then we can pipe all of this, this new data into our ggplot. And here now we can only plot the values that are in the newly created data. So now we have item category and max price change. Um, and now we can we can make a bar plot, or actually technically a column plot um, for this. And we'll talk about that difference in just a second. Um, if we wanted to have color on the outside of a column or bar plot, uh, sometimes it's nice to have a, a border. We can use color outside of the AES function. Um, so just inside of the geom col or geom underscore bar, um, and that'll add an outside border. Okay, this is a, a really important point. Um, so for geom bar, it's, it's going to create a histogram type of thing, which will look at frequencies or counts. And um, so you can only have one mapping, either X or Y for your X or Y axis, but um, geom column or call can have two. However, you need to be careful when you're creating plots, um, even with the skis, because you might not end up creating plots for what you think you're plotting. So here's an example of that. So we're using our food data and we're creating our um, X axis to be our ID variables. So that's pretty straightforward. And on our y-axis, we wanted it to be item price change. And we're creating a column geom. And we want to fill it based on the category of food item. So in general, this looks OK. But if you take a look at the item price change, our y-axis is showing that it goes from 0 to greater than 60. And if you remember how we created our data, and we created our data, so we're really familiar with our data, our price change never went in that range. So if we go back to our data and how we created it, you know, we see values like 0 0.5, 2.5, they're very small. So this has a range of up to 2.5. Here, the maximum is nine. So this is not correct. We're not plotting what we think we are. And we see also from our last plot that the maximum price change was around 9 um, for rice and around 2.5 for pasta. So this can't possibly be. So make sure you check your plot and see if it makes sense. Um, and here we could also check by you know using summarize and summing for um, each of our variables um, and seeing, is that maybe what's happening? And so indeed, when I use summarize here after grouping by item ID um, and I create a, a variable called sum using the sum function on the item price change, I get a value of 10, 5, 32, and 75. And this looks like 10, 
this looks like 75. So indeed what we're plotting here is actually the sum across the item price change, which is not what we wanted. So be careful. Also uh, a major thing for plotting, make sure that your text isn't too small, especially when you copy paste into other things and you have to resize your plot, it can make it really hard to read. Uh, so make, make your text large. And if you don't wanna deal with making the text different for each thing, um, like each title or each um, part of your plot, you can just use element text um, and text equals. So here, instead of saying title, dot text or x axis title axis x title uh, we're just doing text and that will change all of the text on our plot. See, we might have a question. Yeah, so Amy, the the point here is just to be careful about how you're plotting, especially with columns and bars. And in general, it's actually advised not to use bar plots and column plots too much. So bar plots are great for, for like histogram type of thing when you're looking at frequencies. And so um, that's, that's a good, you know, that can be good for assessing the distribution of our data. Um, but when we're trying to compare groups like this, um, it might be better to use a box plot or a geom point or jitter. Um, and you can generally avoid this type of issue. So just be careful with geom bar and um, geom column. So the way that we could fix this, um, here we've done a similar plot where we looked at the max item here and I just, I summarized the data first so that I know what's going into it. And this is indeed what I actually wanted. So let me know if that answered your question. Um, and yes, we are going to cover that in just a second. Okay, so we wanted to cover some extensions for really fancy things you could do with your plot. And then we will cover how to save plots. So if you're making lots of line or spaghetti plots, it can be helpful to directly label the lines as opposed to have really having really complicated legends. So I recommend that you check out a package called Direct Labels. If you want to learn more, this case study about CO2 emissions describes labeling lines in great detail. And um, so if you were to do this, you would need to install the direct labels package, you would need to make sure that the library for it is loaded. And then a lot of these extensions will actually use the name of a plot that you've created. And then you would use that within as, as the input into the direct label function. Um, there's a bunch of methods that you can use. In this case, I'm using angled boxes. And here we see automatically um, we don't have a legend anymore, but our IDs are labeled directly on the line, which can be nice. Um, if we wanted interactive plots, we could use a package called Plotly, and it makes creating interactive plots super easy. So for this, again, we'd have to install the Plotly package, load the library, and um, the function that we would want here is ggplotly. And again, we put the name of the plot as the input to the function. And once we plot this, it will output something like this, where we have a similar plot to what we just created, but now I can hover over items and you know get the actual values and information about what idea it was, et cetera. So this plot doesn't really need to be interactive, but other plots certainly would benefit from it. So it's, it's nice to know about it. If you want more control, um, but in a simple way, I also recommend the GGRAF uh, package. All right, and yes, last part, but not least importantly, how to save a plot. So there's a few ways. Um, if you 
if you export your you can export your plot like this and save it as an image or save as a PDF or even copy the plot to your clipboard. You can also do the zoom option. I don't think this will pop up for you, but if you click zoom, it will um, create a, an, a little window pop up with your plot and you can actually transform the, the dimensions of your plot in the way that you like. And then you can write click it and save that image, or you could take a screenshot. So those, there's, those are two ways that don't involve any code. And then the final way, um, there's actually multiple ways to save with code, but this was a nice one, which is the GG save function. And so you would need the plot that you're trying to save. You need to save that first as an object in your environment, and then you could specify which plot you want. You can describe um, the dimensions that you'd like for your plot and then the file name and path for that. So um, if I wanted to save this plot, I would name this orange. So now I have plot orange in my environment and now I can use my ggsave function. I'll save mine as a PNG. Um, my plot name is plot orange. And if I don't, I don't think you have to specify width or um, other dimensions, but you know, it can be helpful for getting the dimensions that you would like. And then if I were to go to my files, um, I can see the, the plot wherever my working directory is, which it's not there right now. So <laughs> I have to figure out where my working directory is. Here it is. So there's my plot. And if I stop share and I share screen of my plot, I have this beautiful plot here. So if I wanted to do that here this way with the zoom, then I would get a window that looks like this and I can squish the plot or expand the plot and then I could take a screenshot or I could control click or right click um, and copy the image or save the image. So that's how I would do it that way. All right. And then with that, we will continue on with our lab.